Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my podcast, or vodcast, it's a visual thing. Uh, Richard Krause is my special guest. He'll be up in just a bit. If you're watching this on Facebook, you'll probably want to go to YouTube or jamesb.ca. You can see the entire interview with Richard Krause. He's written books, he's been on TV a whole bunch, he has thrown great parties, Oscar parties. He knows everything about movies. He always says, I watch bad movies so you don't have to. And uh, I love his taste in film. So it's going to be exciting to talk to him. But first, I'm going to give you some listings of what's happening in the Toronto area. And I want to thank my sponsors. I want to thank BarberFinancial.com. Captain Paul Barber is a very smart man. Uh, he even once came up with an idea for a rideshare program that could be on an app and it was eight years before Uber and nobody, everyone said, oh, you're crazy. I don't think that's going to work. And sorry, Paul, I was one of those people. Oops, I'm wrong. Um, he's a great guy. He's smart. He's honest. Uh, he's such a nice guy. He makes Jimmy Stewart look like a bully. So if you want to talk to a nice man about finances, if you need help with your business or private, call Captain Paul, Paul Barber at barberfinancial.com. Also, uh, I really want to thank Barbarian Steakhouse it's so delicious in there. I always talk about their food. Uh, they sponsor the show. And I want you to know they have great desserts. Try the House of Chocolate. It's really good. Um, and of course, thank you to my Patreon friends. I know who you are and I will invite you to parties. I will invite you to special events. Uh, membership has its privileges. Please, uh, if you want to donate 5, 10, 20 bucks a month, whatever you can do, I really appreciate it. And a lot of people do. So thanks to all of you. I know who you are. Um, and then, uh, let's move on for a moment. We're going to go right into Hugh's room because there's so much going on. Jane Sibri is there tonight and tomorrow. She is so lovely. Great composer, beautiful angelic voice, and just a beautiful human being. She'll be there tonight and tomorrow off of a tour. She's been in North America and Australia. She'll be great. Uh, on Sunday, uh, there's a woman from Australia. Speaking of that, Allie Hughes is going to be singing uh, Leonard Cohen songs on Sunday. And Dr. Mike Daly on Monday is doing a lecture about the Beatles. It's a lecture and a concert, and he is a smarty pants. Um, and after him, on Wednesday, or sorry, Tuesday, uh, Garrett Mason, the son of Dutch Mason, he'll be there. Wednesday, David Rotundo with his harmonica and his band. Uh, and then, on Thursday, June 6th, the 50th anniversary of Stink. Remember Mainline? It's crazy. I can't believe it's that old, that record. Anyway, uh, Mike McKenna will be there, and uh, Mendelssohn Joe won't. He's painting up north. Uh, but they're going to be doing songs from Stink. That's a really cool idea. All the listings at HughesRoom.com. It's a pretty bluesy uh, week next week. Should be interesting. Um, lots going on at Jazz Bistro, as always. Um, tonight... Don Thompson, Red Schwager, Neil Swainson, Terry Clark. What? Those are four of the most famous jazz people in Canada, and they're all there at Jazz Bistro. Uh, get tickets in advance. Get down there early. It's going to sell out, I, for sure. Um, uh, Sunday, uh, Cold Jack is on Saturday, and Sunday, Angela Taroni has a bunch of students doing some a cappella stuff. Uh, it's called Jazz and Modern Music Ensemble. I'm a fan of Angela. She knows what she's doing when she's teaching kids, and she's got a lovely voice herself. So that should be really cool. Also, two Stephanies this week, Stephanie Trick and Stephanie Martin. Now, Stephanie Trick plays with Paolo Alderighi, and I don't know Paolo, but I sure know Stephanie. She is a wicked piano player. Dick Hyman is a huge fan of her stride playing. Uh, there's going to be four hands on one piano, and it's going to be brilliant. So you might want to get tickets for that, too. Meanwhile, over at Lula Lounge, uh, Havana Club Friday, Salsa Saturday, these are things that are always jammed. Live music, DJs, food, dancing, it's a crazy party every Friday and Saturday. But I want to talk about uh, Gord Sheard. He's got his band, Sanel Alberto, um, in concert, and they're celebrating a new record called A New Day. And Gord Sheard is another fantastic piano player. And to go into Lula and see him play, it's, it's just something else. June 6th is the beginning of Lula World. They bring in amazing music from around the world and, right, because it's world music and it's around the world. Anyway, you've got to check this out. Uh, lots of listings. I'll tell you more about it next week, but go to lula.ca, surf through all their things and make some uh, 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 commitments because your ears are going to love it and your spirit's going to love it. Uh, it's an incredible thing they do over there. Whenever they do Lula World, it's huge and it's all different countries. Um, Homesmith Bar at the Old Mill, tonight, Bonnie Brett. Bonnie Brett uh, had a record, the Elvis Costello songbook, 
Uh, it was played across the country on radio. I loved her version of watching a detective probably as much as Elvis. Uh, she's fantastic. So she's going to be there. Um, also, Dave, uh, Dave Young is there Saturday. Uh, Gene Denovi, Linda Carone, Canadian Jazz Quartet, all kinds of things happening at the Homesmith Bar. Go to Old Mill Toronto, click on events, and you'll get the information. Um, there are no reservations, so you always want to get there before 7.30 when the band starts if you want to get a seat. Uh, don't forget the Rex, the Rex.ca, more than a dozen bands in the next week as always. Uh, Raul Benesia, Mike Murley, Brigham Phillips, uh, Kalia Remu, the Jive Bombers, they're all playing there in the next week. All right, now, Richard Krause. Again, if you don't see the interview after this, go to YouTube or go to my website and you'll see the, excuse me, I have a hiccup, full interview. Better get through this quick. Um, my guest this week is Richard Krause. As I mentioned, he's put out 10 books. Uh, he's been on Rogers, Bravo, CTV. Uh, my favorite book is The 100 Best Movies You've Never Seen. I'd actually seen a bunch of them, but then I found a bunch I'd never seen and I love his taste. So we're going to talk to him right now about movies. Here we go, Richard Krause. How are you? Good, James. How are you? Very nice good. You. Listen, I have known you for decades, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of questions because okay. you've always been that guy that knows about movies, <laughs> but when did it start? When mm -hmm. did you first think, this might be my life? Well, I don't know when I first thought I would make money from it, but I know that the first time that I knew that I loved movies was at the Astor Theater in Liverpool, Nova Scotia, and I went to see The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean. I haven't seen it since, so I may have embellished this scene in my mind, but I remember as a kid, uh, and you know, I'd already seen The Poseidon Adventure probably, and The Sting, and all these other movies that I the loved. The Sting was fantastic, Sting's wasn't fantastic. it? Sting was fantastic. But uh, there's a scene where a character gets shot with a shotgun, the camera's on the face, shotgun blast to the chest, the camera goes down and shoots part of the scene through the hole in his chest. Now, that's how I remember it, whether it's actually real or not, and, and I will never go back and look at it because I want that memory in my head of that. That's what I want it to be. Uh, and I remember, though, my memory tells me that it happened, <laughs> uh, whether it did or not, and that's, that did it. That was the one, right? It there. was that the coolest the shot. And it was the coolest stuff. And, and, and the loved, first Planet of the Apes, the original first one. Well, the first one, but I loved them all. I loved Battle for the Planet of the Apes, which nobody liked. So I liked a lot of that stuff. Was uh, that the last one? I think it's like the third one again. Maybe wrong about that. Uh, beneath? Mm hmm. Uh, 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 Escape from the Planet of the yeah, Apes yeah. was the third one, was and that was the tackiest cool one. Yeah, yeah. With the Grape Juice Plus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, uh, but, but I loved those movies. And I like the idea, uh, and I don't think I realized it then, but I love the idea of being part of the community that makes up the audience. I like sitting, you know, I, all, all show business is the same, right? There's something here, and there's people facing the other way looking at that thing. And I love that movie, sitting in the dark with strangers, hearing people laugh or cry or gasp or whatever reaction they're having to it, but doing it as, as a community. And I, I think that it builds empathy. I think it's hardwired in our DNA to love that experience. I don't think I knew it at that moment, at the time, uh, but over, over the years I've come to realize that that's it. My job affords me access to stuff. I can watch links of new movies at home. I can watch things on my computer, all that sort of thing. I rarely ever do. I want to see stuff in a movie theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the same thing with comedy, that comedy television uh, can improve uh, the amount of people that want to go to a comedy yeah. club, but it does not improve the experience. Because nope. when you're in a club, you're laughing out loud yeah. instead of thinking, oh, that's clever while you go for a sandwich. Well, absolutely. Or playing on your iPhone or whatever it is. And, you know, we go to a place called the Comedy Cellar in New York uh, a lot. We go a, a bunch of times a year. And the thing I love about that place, and I will be so sad when it is gentrified out of existence, like Bleaker Bob's around the corner, the great record store that was there forever, and a few other things on McDougal Street. But uh, this place is cramped. The ceiling's only about this high, uh, it's dark, you're wedged in there with other people, but you're, again, part of this community, like it's dark and low and stuff, it's a perfect room for comedy, and, you know, I go see stand-up as much as I can, and I've never found a better room 
just simply a better room to sit in and watch people be funny. The original Yuck Yucks on, on uh, Yorkville, yeah, yeah, a Street, little black yeah. box, yeah, yeah. Jim Carrey, everybody, right? And, and that's the thing, right? That's I, I think that the you know intimate. I saw Kevin Hart recently at the Bell Center in Montreal and was completely underwhelmed by it because there were thirty thousand people there, and it was big and impersonal, and and I didn't care. Yeah, I found myself not caring. I'm sure he's hilarious in a club, but not so much live. When you're in a theater. Uh, watching a film, what for you is an ideal size theater? Do you have a favorite theater in Toronto these days? Well, it depends on what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. If if it's something like it, uh, I often you know there's a million kinds of movies, but movies that that you'll hear me say often like see this as large and as loud as you can, uh, something like Dunkirk or something like that. That's that requires IMAX, and IMAX is a great experience for movies that will uh, that that are meant to be epic big scale things that you were supposed to be immersed in so IMAX for that kind of thing but I love the varsity you know I've been going to the varsity forever mm -hmm. um, I miss the uptown you know there's all yeah. these theaters that are gone now but I live four seconds away from uh, the varsity so the great thing is when I have my 10 a.m. screenings you know when I have to see stuff in advance I can leave the house, go get a coffee about five minutes before the movie starts and still be there on time. I like that you have uh, this saying about you, you'll see bad movies so other people don't have to. I watch bad movies so you don't have to. So yeah. what are, what are the, what's your ratio? How many, how many bad to mediocre to great movies do you see in, in, in a given year? I think, I see about 400 movies a year. Whoa. And yeah, and, and it's a little less now that I have the, the TV show and I just simply don't have uh, the amount of time. Uh, doing a talk show eats up a lot of my time, but uh, but uh, roughly around 400 movies, and I would say that the top 10% of those are amazing, and they're the super fun ones to write about because they're exciting and 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 you you have stuff to say about them. Then there's the bottom 10%, and again those are super fun often to write about, and nobody sets out to make a bad movie, but sometimes it happens, and when it happens, you know uh, I I'm I'm there to write about it. Then there's the 80% in the middle, and those are the tricky ones because they're not necessarily bad movies, but they are not exceptional. They don't have things, they're the kind of movie that when you're watching trailers, remember when you go to the movies, they play three or four trailers, and then you watch a movie and afterwards you're trying to remember what trailers you saw beforehand, it's because they're probably not exceptional. And that's what a lot of these movies, I always think, you know, the, this 80% of, of films, will I remember anything about this in a week? If I didn't have to write about this, would it actually have, you know, touched me or affected me in some way? And uh, often the answer is no. And those are tough to write about because you still have to write about them entertainingly, have something to say about them, but, you know. Now, you won't go out to justice a movie. I notice you try to find a few redeeming qualities. Yeah, listen, I, I make things. You know, I've written a bunch of books. I've produced a lot of books. TV. Yeah. yeah, 10 books. I've, I've produced a lot of TV. Um, I've, I've, I've worked behind the scenes on a lot of things. And I've never set out to make anything awful. I always try and do uh, the best job, and I assume that everyone else does the same thing. Yeah. And so it, it, my reviews are never personal. My reviews are, are never about the, the actor or the director. Um, it's about the work that we see. I often think of myself more or less as kind of like a consumer advocate. You know, if you're going to spend uh, 50 bucks with popcorn for two people to go see the movie, you want to know what you're in store for. Yeah. And, and, and if the movie's not good, I will let you know. But it's never personal. It's cool because when you do that, you're actually helping people make... Uh, decisions not based on your opinion per se you, like you will give somebody a good idea yeah I mean, I, you, I, you want to talk for more than yourself you're not asking for only because I, I follow your advice and I don't see bad movies yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I think it's it, it's a bit of that I mean people that have been reading me for years I mean I, I don't know how many reviews I've written I mean, it might be 10,000 by now I have no idea it's a lot thousands of them mm -hmm. and and so over time if you do read them every week you will know what I'm predisposed to like or not like so you know that creeps in there but that's I mean we're all we, we all have likes and dislikes no matter what you do if you write about cars you you know sometimes people like cars that go really super fast and are loud and and some people don't some people prefer a, a slow calmer ride yeah I you know I you can tell what my preferences are 
uh, if you if you follow me over time. Yeah. How about the book of the hundred uh, best movies mm -hmm. you've never seen? Uh, that to me is is a go to book. If someone buys one of your books first, yeah. I'd say buy that one. Yeah, I like that one. Are there a couple of movies that you can share right now with people watching that that they probably don't know that they really should? Well, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, when I made up the list, there's two of those books. There's the yep. hundred best movies, and then there's the son of the hundred best movies you've never seen. That's right. And and I like those books. I thought they were they were fun to write. I made up a list, uh, not exactly off the top of my head, but almost of about 400 movies that I wanted to include in these books. And that's where the idea of doing a series came from. And then other things, we got two of them out, and then other things came up, they did well, but who knows, there may be a third to come along. Mm -hmm. But I also wrote a book about a movie called The Devils, Ken Russell's The Devils. If you haven't seen The Devils, that's a movie you have to see. It stars Vanessa Redgrave, Oliver Reed, uh, set in 1632. It is a period piece, absolutely ripped from the pages of history. Aldous Huxley wrote the original text. It's been turned into an opera. There is a play that Jason Robards starred in on Broadway about this. But the movie is uh, hard to find because it was so outrageous when it came out. 1971, big Hollywood movie. Warner Brothers uh, produced it. And it was just at the time when the whole studio system was starting to shift and change a little bit and they were desperate. The studios were making these big musicals, nobody cared about those. Easy Rider comes along and, and, and upends everything. Uh, so they looked for young directors. Ken Russell was 40 years old, which in Hollywood at the time was considered young and he was brash and he had made, you know, movies like Women in Love and that sort of thing. Uh, so they hire him. Thing is, he shot it in England, and the as he told me, the boys from Burbank had no idea what I was doing until they showed up, and they showed up on the day that he was singing or, or shooting uh, a segment called The Rape of Christ, which is uh, naked nuns in a church, uh, and, and it's still... That was shot in 1971. Watch it today. It will still throw your head back. It will still curl your hair. But it's really uh, a movie uh, written from the point of view and directed from the point of view of a guy uh, who was a staunch Catholic. He converted to Catholicism. And he was making a movie that was essentially about the questions he had with his own faith. It's a deeply religious movie, uh, but there are naked nuns and it blows people's <laughs> minds. And it was censored everywhere. The Warner Brothers guys showed up on the day with the naked nuns and uh, kind of shut things down and they had to make some changes. But Ken Russell was absolutely steadfast in his vision for that. And as a result, not a lot of people have seen it. If you have never seen The Devils, find it and watch it and prepare to have your mind absolutely blown. That reminds me of uh, Alejandro Hodorowski, The Holy Mountain. Totally, The Holy Mountain and, and El Topo. El Topo. These, but again, you know, these were all made in and around the same time. We're talking a span of about five years when, when I think people were a little bit more uh, uh, keen to go out and see cinema that really challenged them. El Topo remains a challenging film. The Holy Mountain is a really challenging movie to this day. The Devils will still blow your mind, even though it's Oliver Reed, at the time, probably the biggest British movie star there was. Vanessa Redgrave, I mean, you know, these are, these are big-time actors in a movie that will still uh, blow your mind. And imagine today it would be like having, I don't know, like, uh, you know... Uh, who the like two giant stars in a movie that is so transgressive that that it would be censored everywhere that it George went. Clooney and Marilyn Streep. Yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. Right? And something like that. Imagine that. <laughs> well, it just simply wouldn't happen. I didn't say James Franco and Cameron did, 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 <laughs> for something else. Um, so your upbringing, you you were Liverpool, Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Uh, you had a brother who was into music. Yeah, yeah. My brother uh, was older than me. He was eight years older than me. So uh, he was uh, kind of my beacon all the way through. I was born in 63. So, I, you know, by the time the, the end of the 60s came around, I was listening to music, hanging out with him. Uh, but I didn't really, I was indiscriminate. You know, I liked... Uh, you know, the k -Tel records just as much as I liked Sgt. Pepper, you know, I, but, right. but I loved music and I just, I, and, and, and played it all the time. My dad owned a furniture store and we lived on top of it. We lived in a building. I grew up in a house uh, that uh, is, it's been modified over the years many times, but uh, 
there was a time when Liverpool was thought of as possibly being the next big seaport down there. And so there's stuff there that does not belong in a town of about, when I lived there, were about 1,500 people there. Uh, there was an opera house. There was uh, uh, the movie theater I told you about uh, seats a lot of people. And it was, um, uh, it still is, I think, the, the longest running, uh, continuously operated movie theater uh, in either in the Maritimes or Canada. I can't remember, but it's, but it's beautiful. And there was a vaudeville house. The vaudeville house... Uh, lasted for however long it lasted. Then it became a sawmill, and there's a bunch of stories about the sawmill that I heard, but the sawmill, the one story that I remember well, is uh, these guys are, are, are putting just giant logs through this bandsaw, and a guy cuts one of his fingers off. He just doesn't move his hand in time, and he holds up his hand, and his friend said, Jesus, buddy, what'd you do? He goes, well, I just did this. Shears off the next one. <laughs> Again, whether it's true or not, I don't care, but that's the story. And then eventually, my grandfather bought it and turned it into a giant uh, furniture store with this big apartment on top of it, and we lived in that. Eventually, my dad took it over. And it was fascinating to kind of grow up in that way because, you know, if there was something cool on television, my friends would come over and we'd go down in one of the showrooms and we could turn on 10 televisions and watch the Rolling Stones on Saturday Night Live. Uh, and, and no one would bother us. We were separated enough that no parental guidance. We used to uh, go out, they had these big showrooms, um, displays of like furniture setups, so, you know, sofas and, and, you know, tables and all that kind of stuff. And we would have parties up there. We'd like sit around, like sneaking, say, everybody smoked back then, sneaking yeah. cigarettes and drinking lemon gin on these things <laughs> that, on the weekends. And, uh, and it was a, a really crazy place to grow up in, in, in this big warehouse that was in the back where I imagine the, the, the bulk of the vaudeville theater had once been. Um, we used to uh, tear away at the walls, and it was just sort of old plywood and whatever was on it. You tear away at it, and you would find posters under there for, you know... W.C. Fields or, or, or Cecil right. the Dancing Monkey or something, you know, <laughs> right. like whatever. But you would find, you would find uh, these posters from, you know, a long ago. Wow, yeah, yeah. amazing. When did you decide you had to move? Was this... Oh, when I was about three years old. I mean, I knew, I always okay. knew that in Nova Scotia was great. And, and the town I grew up in, I think, probably did me a whole lot of favors in terms of, you know, uh, socializing me and, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm a polite guy. I don't know. I, I, I think also gratitude. Yeah. When you come from a small town, everything bigger than that, you're grateful for new experiences. Yeah. And, and so, so, but, and this was very small. I mean, it was a beautiful town, but it was a very, very small place. And I always had uh, my my eyes on other stuff. My mother was American, and and so we used to go back uh, often to visit her father in Boston. Um, my uh, aunts and uncle, I had an aunt Helen and uncle Ed, who used to show up every year with a car bigger than the house we were living in, a Cadillac, a new one every single year. Uh, you know, this was sort of you know the the era of like American exceptionalism, right? Yeah, everything had to be big, and you know, like, mm -hmm. and and they they just seemed so impossibly kind of exotic to me, and and so I kind of grew up, you know, living between these two worlds, this small kind of modest Nova Scotia Canadian humble upbringing, and then you know the slightly flashier American side of my family. My grandfather was a musician; he was a jazz trumpet player. Uh, lived in New York in the nineteen twenties and thirties. Eventually uh, moved to Boston and played with everybody. And did you uh, drive to Boston when you were visiting there? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We, it wasn't hard to do. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't hard to do. And and down there, you know, uh, <laughs> in those days, because they have what they call now the new highway. The new highway is probably 40 years old, but people still call it the new highway. Right. Before the new highway were shore roads that went like this, and it would take you three hours to drive what might have been, if it was straight, an hour's drive. Uh, so the idea of driving for five or six hours, well, that's just kind of what you did. If you wanted to get places, you, you kind of right. had to do that. So the idea of driving to Boston was, that was easy. That was easy stuff. Yeah, and then did you, 
fi finally move out after graduating? Is that when you? I did. I left uh, like uh, weeks after after I graduated. I knew, uh, you know, my mother was very ill the whole time I was growing up, uh, and and she. You used to say your you had your dad was a salesman and your mom had cancer. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And oh. and you know, people would say, "What do your parents do?" And and I'd say, "Well, mm -hmm. my dad, you know, my dad uh, runs a furniture store. And my mother has cancer because she was ill the entire time I was growing up." And you know she'd be in remission sometimes, but you know the treatment back then was barbaric. Having gone through it now myself, mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, the it was it was bad enough when I was getting chemo and doing all that stuff uh, five or six years ago. Let alone what it must have been like forty years ago uh, for her, and and uh, and it was tough. I mean, she was very young when she died, and and um, uh, so. You know, she passed away, and I moved away shortly afterwards, uh, and and never looked back. I mean, I came to Toronto. I had I'd worked uh, in a clothing store, Max Harding's clothing store, no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very nice to me, though. The people were very nice to me, and I had saved up like you know a silly little amount of money, 120 bucks or something. And I came to Toronto. Uh, my brother was living here. My brother and his friends. What year was that? Uh, probably like 1980. Yep. Yeah, 81 maybe, possibly. So we're both born the same year and we both got here in 1980. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. very strange. Toronto got a lot more fun <laughs> My in mom 1980. also died of cancer, so uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're on a roll here. Yeah. Well, and so, so we get there and my brother and uh, his friends and I go out. I'm the only one that has any money. My brother's going to school up here. I've got the 120 bucks that's supposed to get me set up. I had a place to live, but still. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Frank Fatir's on College Street, right? College and Young. Uh, had pizzas and, you know, whatever there. Then went to the Elma Cabo and watched uh, B.B. Gabor play, which absolutely blew my mind because, again, the Rolling Stones had just played there, you know, in the recent past, three yeah, or four years before then, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I had always heard of this place. It was legendary. I was too young to be there, but I looked old enough. I got in. And we saw B.B. Gabor, and I loved that record with Net Net Soviet on it and, right. and Moscow Drug Club and all that stuff. So you would have been 18, one year yeah. underage. Yep. And 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 uh, and B.B. Gabor was amazing. And I still remember, uh, I was just knocked out by the show. I hadn't seen that many close-up live actual rock and roll shows mm -hmm. uh, and then so we we're all stomping and, and, and howling to get him back on stage at the end of the show and he came out and played a pretty straight ahead version of Thank Heaven for Little Girls and it was the craziest <laughs> thing I, <laughs> I loved him I I, 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 uh, I always thought that he was a very like a unique interesting character around town yep. yeah now you also were here uh, with other unique characters like Gino Empry. Did you have many run-ins with Gino Empry? I had a lot of run-ins with Gino, and, and I love Gino. He, you know, uh, again, for me, as this kind of showbiz-obsessed kid, you know, growing up, I read Rona Barrett's Hollywood magazine and, and, and any book that I could find, and it didn't matter. If it was a biography about someone who had been an actor uh, or a musician, it didn't matter whether I had seen their movies or heard their music. Like, I was just interested... In showbiz, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I moved here, Gino was, you know, kind of a, oh, he was the big wheel around town. He was the publicist for most everybody mm -hmm. uh, in town, the Imperial Room and the Theater on the Dell and everything in between. And so I did some work for Gino, and I used to get to go to these shows. So I met Peggy Lee that way. I met Ella Fitzgerald that way. Uh, but I was just, I always find it kind of funny. Like I, I was 18, 19, maybe 20. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, years old, and I, you know, I'd go to a vintage store and buy a suit that was three times very thin back then too. It was probably three times, you know, too big for me. Grab a date, and we'd get an amazing table to watch Ella Fitzgerald at the Imperial Room. Louis Janetta would seat us, mm -hmm. and and uh, I always remember that Gina would be like, "Oh, uh, everybody, please enjoy. Uh, this, this is going to be a great show." As soon as the show started, he'd fall asleep. And, he, and, and as lights came up at intermission, he'd be like, that was amazing, that was yeah. incredible. That was Narcolepsy. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was incredible. <laughs> and, and he wore this big uh, uh, fish pendant yeah. for a lot of the time. And it was big. I mean, this thing was this big. It yeah. was, uh, he was an absolute It was a gift character. from Lena Horne. 
was that? And his family have it now. Is that right? I had to find out where that fish yeah. was. Well, I, I, you know, Gino for me uh, was just like the epitome of someone who I'd never met before in my life. Absolutely never met a character like him ever before, and, and really not since. I know. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I want to toast you right now. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, Gino. to the memory of Gino. Gino. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. So uh, when it comes to now, years have passed now, and you've done this so many times, you've written so many books. Do you ever get starstruck? Is there somebody that you would interview that we, you might get tongue-tied? Uh, David Bowie definitely would have been that for me. Um, I, I never got to meet him. Uh, Tom Waits w would likely set me back a little bit. Um, you know, I, I've kind of interviewed everybody, and that, I mean, that sounds like hubris, but I kind of have interviewed everybody, and, and I don't really, I, I don't know what happens. I think that, generally speaking, I, I, I look at the interview as just a job that I have to do. You know, there's been a couple of times, Robert Duvall, I remember sitting, Robert Duvall, I've interviewed him a number of times, but over the years he's gotten a little deaf and you have to sit fairly close to him when you're doing the interview and things. And so I was sitting next to him and I was talking like this, asking him questions, and then he would start to talk and I would find my mind start to wander because all I could hear him say was, you know, I love the smell of napalm in the morning and, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm sitting, to the, you know, with Tom Hagen from The Godfather. Like, it, it, it kind of, it, it took me out of it and I was probably kind of a weirdo then. Um, Dustin Hoffman, uh, we were doing this interview and he was, I wasn't particularly starstruck at the beginning of the interview, but he kept messing around with his watch, and he was just there was something about it that he just he was bugging me. He couldn't set the the timer or something on it, so I said, "Give it to me, give me the watch, and I'll fix it." So I fit, and when I gave it back to him, the way he said thank you reminded me of the graduate in such a way that I'm like, "Oh my God, I'm sitting with Dustin Hoffman," you know. And every now and again, it does happen. You yeah. Know? There's a there's a picture that my wife loves of me and Francis Ford Coppola. And Coppola is talking, and I'm sitting there literally like this. <laughs> like, you know, absolutely gobsmacked that yeah. this man is talking to me. Did you ever meet a celebrity? Because I know what press junkets are like from doing that myself. And, yeah. and mine were, I was always a nerd because right. I don't do them all the time. Yeah, but yeah. for someone who does them all the time, some did you did you meet people that were just not in a good mood and they oh, were really yeah. difficult to no, get something absolutely. out of? Absolutely, I mean, I don't do them so much anymore. Uh, it's pretty rare that I do. Them. I, you know, my my new TV show, Pop Life. We do longer form things. You do a press junket. That actor or writer or director, whoever it is, is going to do forty interviews that day. Yeah. They're all three and a half, four minutes long, and all anyone's looking for is that little sound bite. Yeah. You know, and that's all they want. Yeah. Truly and, boring for them. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's horrific. in fact they're act they're just acting. Yeah, because they don't want anything real. Well, yeah. I, I, I back when I was doing them, I remember uh, being in Los Angeles and, and interviewing uh, Steve uh, Martin, and our, the interview went fine. It was good enough. And then after it was over, I said, and, and I, this is my I, sort of my standard line. Like, I was like, enjoy the rest of your day. And Steve Martin looked up and went, you know that won't be possible. <laughs> because <laughs> right. he still had 30 more of these things to do. <laughs> and he's going to get asked the same questions over and over again. Right. And so, yeah, you do get people that are grumpy. Uh, Sally Field was not particularly open uh, to me one day um, when I interviewed her. I hear that she's lovely, but... When I came in the room, I sat down, and she had a clipboard, and she was like, name. And I'm like, they just announced me. And they always announce you at the door. And I was like, it's Richard. And she, and she takes her glass off. All right. And then she's like, let's do this. And it was like, it was coldly professional. But she was fine on camera. Mm -hmm. So and really, that's all that, that really matters. Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer. Uh, I was in Hawaii to interview Jerry Bruckheimer uh, once. And... We were on the, the, the uh, deck of the USS John Stennis, this giant aircraft carrier. We were doing interviews for the movie uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, we had done a thousand interviews. There was just uh, the, the entire cast. And you interviewed everybody who had ever, you know, had anything to do with the movie. And Brock Harbor was one of them. He was the producer of the film. And so I go into the setup and I realize that he's sitting on a chair that's elevated. He's up a little higher than the interviewer's chair. Whatever, sure. I sit down in my chair, he pulls out a camera, whoosh, takes a picture, it's a Polaroid, he pulls it in, it goes, name, and I said, Richard Krause, writes it down, and he puts them on a stack of Polaroids sitting next to him. So he's taking my picture now, 
which I thought was kind of an unusual thing. Yeah. And I said, Mr. Bruckheimer, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And he went like this and just put his arm up mm -hmm. like this so that I had to get up out of my seat and go to him and kind of genuflect and to shake right. his hand. Right. And, like the and Pope man, the king. was that a lesson in, in what Hollywood power plays are about, right? You know, uh, uh, Jack Warner's office desk was elevated so that everyone that came in, no matter how big the star, when they came in to renegotiate the contract, they were in the inferior position. Right. And it's he's got the light cool. behind him, yeah. so he's like a shadow oh, high above you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah, you know, sometimes, sometimes, I, I, you know, I, I, I had this idea kicking around in my head for a long time to write a book uh, called, like, Lessons that I accidentally learned from the rich and famous, and and it would take experiences like that, and then sort of tease a moral out of them or a, or a life lesson of some right. sort. And I know that they're in within that Jerry Bruckheimer story somewhere is a great life lesson. I'm just still working on what it is. <laughs> still working on it. So you did TVO and Rogers and Bravo and CTV, and I'm wondering with the new show, how did that come about? I mean, it seems like a natural evolution. Yeah, I'd always wanted to do something like this. I mean, I you know. I've reviewed. I used to write about music years ago, and then, then the reviewing films on television it did really well for me, and I did that for twenty years and continued to do or twenty five years mm -hmm. or something a long time. Uh, but I wanted to do something else. I mean, I was my books were all like a little bit different. They weren't all about movies or all about music or whatever. They were they were various topics, and I wanted to try something else. And the new show, uh, Pop Life, is a, a talk show. Uh, where I wanted, I wanted it to be fun but not frivolous. We don't play games. We don't, you know, we have conversations. I imagined in the initial stages of it that it was kind of like a, a podcast with pictures, uh, but you know, it's still it's it's network television, so it's formatted to a certain extent. So we had to figure out a format, which was a feature interview, a panel, and then a thing called Last Call, where I just look in the camera and, and tell a story mm -hmm. uh, that's based on what we've just talked about, uh, and. You know, the the thing that I didn't want to do on it is ever say, now let's have a look at a clip. No clips. I want people to come in uh, and tell stories. Uh, it's not promotional. Uh, when we do these interviews, uh, we have shot several that have turned into kind of promotional vehicles for whatever that person is working on then. And generally speaking, we don't use that stuff because... I want to give people, we'll mention, you got a new book out or a new record or movie or whatever, but I want people to be interested in the person that I'm talking to and then seek out what it is that they do. Yep. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, Fran Leibowitz or Josh Groban, uh, I approach the interviews from exactly the same point of view. These are interesting people that are going to have fascinating stories. These are interesting people that have lived a life I haven't led, you know. Frank Leibowitz and Andy Warhol were friends. Tell me about that. Josh Groban, I want to find out what it's like when you write a song. You tell me you write songs on his iPhone, you know, sort of writes the lyrics. And then, you know, a month or two later, you're doing a concert in, in uh, Central Park and 50,000 people are singing along to those words that you wrote on your iPhone a couple of months before. I want to know what that feels like. I want to know those kind of stories, stories that are from uh, people's experience that 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 I haven't had and that most of the people watching have never had. That's right. And the fact that you're not jaded, you come across as a natural guy, makes people comfortable. Everything I've seen from you, yep. people are comfortable to just talk to you. I, I think so. People up. get comfortable. I mean, you know, we're, it's set in a bar, which is, which is the other part of this. What we decided early on uh, was that I didn't want to do a desk. I didn't want to have the thing. I didn't want it to look like everything else. Um, and we had a meeting, and, and it came out of one meeting where we said something like, you know, where do you have the best conversations? And I said, well, I was a bartender for a billion years, and I, I've had some of the best conversations uh, I've ever had over a drink in a bar. And they're like, well, let's build you a bar. So they built me a giant bar, which uh, honestly is nicer than a lot of the real bars that I've worked in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And cheers, cheers, because here you are in a beautiful bar. I know, right? Thanks to the uh, miracle of green screen and J.J. Brown. <laughs> Um, so the show is happening now. It, what is the next? Is there a next thing in your head? Have, have you imagined writing thing. writing a film or? or no, I, 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 yeah, no. I like going to the movies. I don't want to write them. I don't really want to read your screenplay. I don't want to watch an unfinished cut of your movie. Um, I like going to the theater and seeing something that 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 is finished. Yeah. yeah. And and frankly, I get approached all the time. You know, read my screenplay. Do all this stuff. I'm not sure that I have a lot to offer in that way. 
um, you know, I, that's that's not what I do. I do a very specific thing. I watch something that's done and then comment on it. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, there'll be there'll be other things. I've got a few ideas for books that are sort of swimming around. Um, I love the idea of exploring more. I've got I've, I've I have a podcast. I do radio as well. I've got a podcast and all that stuff. But I want to do something more there. I want to always find a way to imbue whatever it is that I'm doing with some kind of meaning, not only for me, but for uh, the, the person that's watching it. Like, you know, Pop Life, sure, we sit around in a bar and we, we drink wine and, and uh, you know, talk about people's lives. But I always like to think that there's something that comes out of it that could be useful to someone. Yep. And, you know, we we do a feature interview and then we tease a topic out of that and then we, we move it on over to uh, to the panel. And so, and it could be about uh, anything. We, we've discussed everything from what it's like to be a stand-up comedian to what it's like uh, to, to uh, work your way through life with mental illness to everything. Some of the topics are really serious, some of them aren't, but in each and every show, I always think that there's something like sticky content that kind of hangs with you, mm -hmm. and and that's what I want. I and moving forward, as I get older uh, and things, I think it's kind of important, you know, to kind of leave something uh, interesting behind. Right, and those these people are comfortable with you, and you're showing the normal humanity, the normalness of being a celebrity. Which is different than the three-minute puff piece that you used to well, have to do. Well, totally, and, and and it takes a, a while. Often, you know, when we do these, you know, longer form interviews, the first four or five minutes, uh, or even longer, it, they always say it takes eleven minutes to establish a connection with somebody uh, when you're having a conversation. If you don't know them, and I don't know most of these people that come on the show, yeah. and so we'll often banter and talk, and and it takes a little while to knock them off their talking points. So, I hope that's an interesting text. And that text just says we're almost out of time. Oh no! No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, it but, says let's let's have a look at a clip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I did want to ask a, a parting thought here of something that has come out recently that you think people need to see. Um, something that's come out recently. Uh, there's a movie called Book Smart, Olivia Wilde's directorial feature directorial debut, uh, which was. Uh, it stars two women, was written by uh, a, a team of women, three or four uh, uh, women writers, directed by Olivia Wilde, and it is a high school, kind of raucous high school drama, I think like super bad, that kind of thing, but done from a very different point of view, and it's hysterically funny, it's poignant, it's great. Wow. Book smart. Thank you, book go. smart. Yeah. I love that. Cheers to you. Cheers. Thank you so much. Cheers, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard Krause. <clears throat> I will be dressed in a different suit uh, next week, so please join me. See what I'm wearing. See who I'm talking to. Every Friday, James B. Podcast. Please share this with your friends. Send it around with wild, joyous abandon. And if you haven't seen all the shows, maybe go back in the logs there and take a look at some of the other interviews. All right, I'll see you next Friday. Bye.